Hello world. Can you guess who I am? I bet you can. And what would you like Santa Claus to bring you for this combination Christmas Hanukkah where Hanukkah and Christmas line up the same timing on the solar calendar? The Jews and the Christians together. What would a Santa Claus bring? Something the whole world needs. An alternative to Trump. The way of a peaceful revolution. I have online peacefulrevolution.us. It's just the beginning. I'm going to read you from that. Direct democracy actual democracy replacing our failed representative government. People are saying we need an alternative. I'm the guy to put it in words, the alternative. Spelling out the alternative. You'll see I do try to do it, the job. I do try to come up with the words so that we aren't milling around in some uh, plaza that occupy somebody asked to be heard by all and here's the language direct democracy actual democracy replacing our failed representative government we have the electronics we have the technology we don't need representative government we can have an actual democracy and our representative government is a failure if we scope the problems with the failure Politics itself, that word, is a pathological reality that our two-party system is a disaster. There are rules in most legislative bodies, including our federal Congress and Senate, where the Republicans and Democrats are strictly into making deals and there's not this reasoning together that was the hope for democracy in the beginning, that people could reason together. That was the hope. Instead of rule by an upper class, a caste system of the rich, the kings, the monarchy, whatever, we have less than 1% with the power that is the money power. We have the money power. That's what a democracy is all about, sharing power. The power is money, and that money is in the grip of, you know, a thousand people own more wealth than the rest of the planet. That's what's going on. And so what is the revolution? The revolution is for us as a people of the planet saying we're going to switch it back to the public owning it. That's the revolution. How do we do that? I propose we create a government in waiting. I'll read that in a sec. In which we describe the changes we're going to make, including transferring wealth. How do you do that? You declare the public, the owners of the corporations, the business world, the whole deal, the people who are working on their ownership issues of uh, their little business, their home. That's not a problem. We can call off all the mortgages, all the debt paid off. That's one of the advantages of a peaceful revolution. We the people can just make that decision. But I say let's go deeper. Let's really consider the role of money in our lives as a people and go for that feeling inside of full human dignity that you don't have to be bossed around to survive. You don't have to say, yes, sir, mister, what's my job? We're going to reconsider what work is in our lives. And what I'm proposing is that we reindustrialize as a people, not leaving it to uh, rich guys scheming about, let's set up a business to do this and that, but let's talk aloud as a people, what is to be done to save our planet? Solar energy, wind energy, those are high priorities. And when it comes to reindustrializing, manufacturing, I propose that as a whole people, we consider what to make, how to make it, who wants to make it, where to make it. We quit playing commercial games. I'm talking about rescuing our culture from commercialism as a people to identify the ways that are going on now, the ways of the business world, the ways of capitalism, the ways of commercialism, the ways of the business world are to take advantage of the public. 
in the interest of the stockholders. And I'm saying, hello, we make the public the stockholders, hello, now we're going <laughs> to have a consistent path, a new aim that the corporations will actually be having a new orientation. They will be favoring the public, serving the public, doing right by what's the moral, rational thing to do. That's what we propose replacing the business way of doing things, the commercial mentality, the, what's going on in boardrooms now, in which they confess, look, we learned at business school, we're not supposed to be moral, we're just supposed to make monies for the stockholders. Well, if that's the game, game over, fellas and gals, it's going to be a moral, rational order. That's the name of the game, the peaceful revolution, the government in waiting, that will be their aim to design, redesign our social forms, our economic system, our media system, religion too for that matter. More on that later. <laughs> our world. As far as how bad Trump is, my camera lady has reminded me that we are dealing with fascism, that fascism is when the business world and the government team up that does squeeze out the little guy totally because, as I was just saying, the orientation of the corporation is to serve the stockholders, which is that 1% all over again. So if you're serving the 1% instead of the public, that means you're victimizing the public. You're not doing right by the public. You're not doing good by the public. And I'm saying, hello, that's the deal. We're switching from the Trump idea where he is giving the power to the business world and to the military world, the military industrial complex, right there, he handed it to him. One point I should make up front, Trump fooled a lot of people into believing that there was some connection between what he said he would do and what he would in fact do. That Trump has the neurological arrangement in his head of a con man, a psychopath, a sociopath, that when he says he'll do something, he doesn't have a conscience like the rest of us to follow through. It's as if he didn't even say it. That's the reality of Trump. We are stuck with a guy that bad that we can't afford to give him four more years or kick him out and get pence. He's not so hot either. What I'm proposing is that we use this as an opportunity to face the reality that our government does need replacement, that even if it wasn't Trump, it is a fact that America should face that our government has turned against its people. Our foreign policy since World War II is a national disgrace. We have been doing horrible things around the world. When they talk about how dare the Russians try to influence our election, the U.S. government has done all kinds of dirty tricks to interfere in the elections of many, many countries, including Russia's government. The United States actually funded different groups in Russia to bring about the USSR's falling apart. And on my YouTube videos, I have this expert, Sean Gervasi, G-E-R-V-A-S-I, who explains in detail how the U.S. hired a think tank. What can we do? How can we use our seven times greater than Russia's economic power to bring them down? And we teased them into invading, or not invading, I can't say that. We invaded Afghanistan with terrorists and we got their government to invite Russia to help them. And then we bleeded Russia quite deliberately. This is the story Sean Gervasi tells. I won't get into that in detail. But to say we, the United States, our government, took aim on the USSR and blew it apart. Which reminds me if uh, it had been Hillary instead of Donald, she had the wrong attitude toward Russia. She had a belligerence that was beyond reason. I did see a cartoon I sent around a little of Hillary and Bill Clinton at little tables. Instead of selling lemonade, they're offering their services as public speeches. Instead of $200,000 or $300,000, a speech of promises to the business community. 
they uh, were offering their services for like twenty dollars <laughs> and they weren't getting any takers they weren't hiring Hillary to give speeches now that she can't deliver her promises as a government operative so let me read uh, more from peacefulrevolution.us direct democracy replacing our failed representative government public corporations of for and by the people serving the public and the planet by public ownership that's how we shift the wealth from the rich to the people we announce ourselves the owners of the corporations we begin creating a government in waiting to lead us in a national discussion to articulate the alternative we then peacefully vote into happening a legal system that provides justice we rescue our culture our planet from commercialism replacing immoral capitalism with the ways of the clear conscience a moral rational order we reconsider the role of money in our lives in society work worth doing for all at living wages now that is a big one that phraseology came to mind early in the 60s work worth doing the shortage of jobs that when you look around for a job right now you're just looking for some pay but in terms of that feeling in your heart work worth doing most people are deprived of that working in corporations they felt like the products they were making shouldn't even be made they could see tricks that were being played planned obsolescence in particular we weren't making goods made in the USA that were really stuff we could be proud of made in the USA but that's what I'm proposing that we as a people feel that dedication to using our powers for the good of people instead of the commercial business think where we're just hustling profits for our rich few a new way of doing things what do you call it is it communism is it socialism if I'm talking government ownership popular ownership of the corporations hello that is a form of socialism socialism I'm proposing an American form of socialism and I'll talk about that but in particular I'm proposing that what the America form of socialism what that word American means in this sense is a cherishing of the individual I have studied as you'll learn about individual forms of human nature and I do believe that we should experiment you'll see with both individual and group management that individuals do make good managers and that's part of the success of capitalism is that we had some bosses that made clever decisions we can have both ways of running things that in a socialist society we do have a faith in group think and group discussion coming up with good discussions and so the idea is to have both have ex opportunities for anybody with a good idea to have their idea tried implemented listen to I'll say that one again we rescue our culture our planet from commercialism replacing immoral capitalism with morality with a moral rational order the ways of the clear conscience that's another thing a lot of people at the end of the day what do they do they drink why do they drink because <laughs> they feel <laughs> their day was not doing right they have trouble with their conscience or they took crap from management that they would have preferred saying hey don't do that stop I don't like it we reconsider the role of money in our lives in society work worth doing for all at living wages we decide as a people what services to provide what goods to make where and how to make them now here's a new idea a thousand dollars a week for every citizen every fifth year so everyone can feel free at least once in a while now imagine if you had a thousand dollar check coming in not a thousand a month hello a thousand a week what would that feel like is that the beginning of feeling like freedom 
Hello. I do propose in other versions of this idea that we give everybody a thousand dollars a week all the time. <laughs> and that is something we can consider. In order to make that work, we would need a public that is willing to say, I'll work, I'll do, I'll help. <laughs> I will help with my abilities without the forcing of money on the subject. Or if I work, I get more money, all that kind of stuff. But at least one year in five, one year in four, one year in seven. Here I propose work four years and get your fifth free. A thousand dollars a week for every citizen, every fifth year, so everyone can feel free at least once in a while. Cancellation of debt. Hello, that should be a major <laughs> plus of this revolution. <laughs> All those home mortgages, those school loans, off the books. Now, it turns out that on our dollar bill, it does say, in God we trust. And wouldn't you know it, that God that uh, that name is about, the Old Testament God, is the instruction for every seven years, every seven times seven years, every 50 years, for all debt to be canceled. The year 2000 came up, that would have been a good time. It rhymes with 50, 2000. That would have been a time for the cancellation of all debt. I did drive around my truck that said cancel all debt, <laughs> but it didn't happen. I think the Pope, he did um, find that part in the Bible where next to it, it says to free prisoners. And he said, okay, well, at least we should free some prisoners. <laughs> But he didn't push for the Old Testament rule that we start fresh. And indeed, wiping off debt is a oh, an improvement in the human condition. I mean, that's the Bible guys who wrote the Bible stuff up. They said, you know, that is a good idea. Every once in a while, clean out that nightmare. We experiment with group and individual management, individuality and human solidarity thriving. Okay, communism, socialism is human solidarity. That means kids are taught in school, in their families, in our culture, in our media, that the normal way to be is not anymore the business world looking at each other as a potential victim, customer, sucker, but looking at each other more like brother and sister. Empathy, sympathy, caring. So we're talking about our becoming a caring people. And to the extent we can have an abundance, that caring gets helped along. But I'm saying in addition to the solidarity, we should also have a respect a cherishing of individuality, where individual differences, individual ways of thinking, individual ways of doing things, is given a full measure of opportunity. We do what needs to be done to save our planet. So imagine that discussion where we don't wait for indirect approaches, wait for some government program, wait for some corporation to come up with some new product, which does remind me, the Trump administration is the death of the planet. That does create the logic of Santa Claus bringing you the revolution, not four more years, but we need a fairly quick turnover to a new bunch of people running the show. That our entire government is no longer a real democracy. It's, well, the big thing is to compare it with what I'm proposing. And what I'm proposing our new voices, that what a democracy is about is people talking to people. We have voices addressing the public. People like Amy Goodman, Medea Benjamin, Naomi Klein, telling the truth, saying this is the way it ought to be. This is wrong. This is how we can achieve the salvation of our planet, prosperity, human health. And they can choose who else is worth coming forward. Tom Hartman, 
Ralph Nader, Noam Chomsky, Richard Wolf, Mark Crispin Miller. I have a list online. We do what needs to be done to save our planet. So let's have that discussion where we go about it directly. That's the peaceful revolution idea. We go at these problems directly. We discuss them directly. What needs to be done if the people have the power to make it done? If the people own the economy, we can do what needs to be done. Let's redesign society with a blank slate. We do what needs to be done to save our planet. We end U.S. military and economic domination. The U.S. has been a dominator of the world. Like the Roman Empire, we have been that cruel boss of the world. And when Trump says he wants to make America great again, the greatness he's talking about is the good old days in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, where we were ripping off the world, where we were bombing country after country, where we were doing regime changes of democratically elected governments in so many countries. Here's the drink I recommend, folks. <clears throat> Water. This is New York City tap water. For the moment, it's pretty good. The rest of the world should have tap water that good, but it could be better. We end U.S. military and economic domination and become a true friend to the world. That's the other. We awake as a whole people to the wrongs of our government throughout the world, reading together books like Killing Hope, we learn of our corporate government fooling us with false flag terrorism. False flag terrorism. Do we know what false flag terrorism is? Our government has become an expert at that. We create events in which there's explosions, there's deaths, and if the public knew the whole story, it would be something else, but the public is fooled. The Oklahoma bombing was arranged by the U.S. government. That has come out. There were participants in the bombing that were U.S. government informers. The FBI, under the leadership of Clinton, wanted to shake up the public with using real explosives. But in particular, 9-11. Santa Claus brings you 9-11 truth this holiday season, Christmas and Hanukkah. Here's the proof that 9-11, that the World Trade Centers came down the way they did because not of the planes hitting them, but because of deliberately placed, expertly placed by demolition teams, cutting charges and explosives throughout the towers, the buildings, and Building 7. They had those arrangements of the tools of controlled demolition in place. How were those demolition instruments installed? I'll tell you the answer. On September 12th, the year 2000, exactly 365 days before 9-11, the owners of the World Trade Center, the Port Authority, put up a request for bids. Who wants to remove all the asbestos floor tiles in the towers and take them somewhere, get rid of that asbestos? which is not easy to do. Ordinarily, you have to pay people to endure that insult to their environment to store as garbage your asbestos floor tiles. They put up a request for bids. Now, online, you could see that they had already had contracts with companies to deal with just asbestos floor tiles in one or two floors. And those contracts were of the order of 300,000, 500,000. The low bid to do 
120 floors of both towers, that's 200, 110 floors, that's 220 floors in the two towers, and then Building 7, I think they had that one too. The winning bid to get that job was a mere $1 million. The company LVI Services Incorporated, that gave them the run of the buildings, and if you look online, LVI Services Incorporated, online right now, or you could look at it along the way, it said that the principal business of LVI Services Incorporated is controlled demolition of buildings. So there it was, folks, and they are a subcontractor for Controlled Demolition Incorporated, one of the largest demolition companies in the world, the most experienced building, build, bringing buildings down and the company who got the job to clean up the Oklahoma bombing and they got the job to clean up the World Trade Center bombing. Uh, I said bombing, uh, demolition. <clears throat> as far as the airplanes and the jet fuel, that's a bad joke. That the fires were going out, the, the collapses of the buildings happened nearly an hour or more. In one case, less than an hour, in the other case, more than an hour. But about an hour after the, the hits, and one hit was through the middle, one was through a corner. In one, the fuel burned up in the first couple of seconds, and the other, it burned up in the first 15 minutes. But those fires were out, and those fires were definitely not hot enough to do the damage. Here is the damage. Here's the million dollar picture, if I can find it. Here is the picture. Can I make it any bigger? What's important about this picture? Do you see what's important? What's important? This is steel. It looks like wood, <laughs> but it's steel. These are individual pieces of steel. And what's important to know about that, I put in words on my Facebook page I say on my Facebook page, Joseph Friendly, here's a photo that makes quite clear the World Trade Center collapse was a result of controlled demolition with so many pieces of structural steel thrust outward. The demolition company advertised that when they bring a building down, they arrange for the steel to be cut into lengths of about 30 feet long for convenient fitting on flatbed trucks about 400 truckloads of steel were loaded each night, and each flatbed truck holds, you know, at least three, maybe 10, 12, whatever. So these are individual lengths of 30 feet long steel structure that has already been popped. Now, I was saying, I'll make it a little bigger. Nine eleven was a big lie. I'm going to talk more about the demolition. The way the buildings were built, there was a central core of massive columns. These columns had steel that was four inches thick in rectangles about this big. Columns. Steel, four inches thick, rectangular cross-section. And these were the first things that were built and then on the four and they were in the middle of the building and then the cranes that assembled the rest of the building were were attached to these steel beams these columns so they just had the rest of the cranes attached to these beams in the four corners and they built the building around these core beams core columns and the elevators were among the, the core columns. So LVI and their buddies in Cold Control Demolition Incorporated could put the elevators out of service, 
and control the elevators so that there could be demolition crews riding on top of the elevators that would give them convenient access to the whole elevator shaft. And these core columns were in the elevator shaft. So some of those pieces you see there are pieces of these core beams. They would stop more or less every other floor and that would give them the 30 foot lengths just right for loading on flatbed trucks. Incidentally, it's a reality that these trucks were only loaded at night. They did not want pictures of what the ends of these beams look like because if you see the ends, you see they were cut. When a cutting charge, oh, I didn't tell you what a cutting charge is. I was saying every other floor they attach cutting charges. What the cutting charges are nowadays, they look like a sausage, like a salami. They are a mixture of aluminum, ferrous oxide, otherwise known as rust, and other stuff like sulfur, molybdenum, but mostly it's just aluminum and rust. And the ferrous oxide gives its oxygen to the aluminum in the reaction, forming aluminum oxide. And that ferrous becomes pure iron at a temperature of 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Steel melts at 2,800 about. So if you come at it with a sausage that's at 4,500 degrees, it slices right through like a knife through butter through steel that melts at 2,800. So that's the trick of control demolition. They don't explode the beams, they cut right through and they can do it in a matter of about a second. It's just, it's so hot, 4,500 degrees at a steel that melts at 2,800. It evaporates. And what happens is you have molten iron that then drops down the elevator shafts and sure enough in World Trade Center Ground Zero there was molten iron all over the place and plenty of it at the bottom of the elevator shafts. So hello, as far as needing an investigation, we don't need an investigation. What we need to do is face the truth that the facts are there. We have architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth that have all this information, or most of it. The story of LVI hasn't been part of the truth movement, but I do offer that additional input that LVI apparently um, played a major role in arranging the demolition. Uh, let's go to LVI. That's another thing I could do. Um, if you Google LVI services images, what I wanted to show you, there's a picture, if you go to LVI images, there's a picture of guys on a scaffold dealing with a ceiling that has this shape. It's corrugated, a corrugated ceiling. It turns out that the floors of the World Trade Center, the underside of the floors, the concrete was poured on corrugated steel pans. And what these guys, what LVI had to do was apply a very high-tech super explosive as a paint upon the underside of the floors because it is a reality, and this is an important fact, Santa Claus brings you for <laughs> seasons. Listen to this. The official story is a joke for this reason. If the planes had done their damage and caused the building to collapse, you would have had a stack of cards, the floors. But the, chlor the flooring, the concrete flooring, four and a half inches thick concrete on steel reinforced pans was not at the scene. It had turned into what they call an extremely fine dust. And that is, in the dust, they found this super explosive. And what was the super explosive? I was telling you before that the cutting charges are rust and aluminum, where the oxygen joins up with the aluminum from the rust and makes the iron prealga. Well, introduce nanotechnology. Makes the iron what? Hot. Oh, it makes the, the free iron becomes 4,500 degrees iron. About 50 years ago, they discovered nanotechnology, that if they use lasers, 
with computers and they focus real carefully with um, electronic microscopes, electron microscopes, that if they make stuff extra small, they get new chemical properties. So they tried that on the aluminum and rust particles, thermite, thermate, and they made the particles much smaller than usual and it turned out to be an explosive a super explosive it was more explosive than dynamite tnt c4 wow it was so explosive that they decided they could just put it on thin and it would do a lot of damage so they said let's add paint to it and paint it on and what happened was it didn't work because the paint interfered with the physical touching of the particles and what they found in the 9-11 dust in a peer-reviewed journal article of April 09 by Niels Herrett from Scandinavia, what they found was how they solved the problem of the paint. What they found in the dust was silicon carbide bubbles within which were perfectly formed aluminum plates nestled with lots of little cubes of ferrous oxide. So those cubes had a nice flat surface to touch up against the aluminum plates. And these were nano size. We're talking smaller than a human hair that could only be made by very high technology. That's what they found in the dust. That's the proof that this was our government fooling the people. This was not the Arabs. This was Cheney and Rumsfeld, our government paying the bills to set us up so that we could then blame it on the Arabs and the Muslims and play all that game. But Santa Claus is bringing you the truth for Christmas <laughs> and Hanukkah. Um, let's see, what else we got here? We learn of our corrupt government fooling us with false flag terrorism like 9-11, obviously controlled demolition. We view as a whole people 9-11 documentaries like Massimo Mazzucco's The New Pearl Harbor, and then I say, look online for Joe Friendly's plan for peaceful but total revolution. And I give the website, it's really joefriendly.com. Uh, and then I talk about what's on joefriendly.org. And that is a solar compass for sorting humanity, achieving harmony, navigating the human domain, achieving efficient group think. And that is an important point. Let me make that clear. Santa Claus brings you for Christmas a Copernicus for the humanities. I make that claim. I am a Copernicus for the humanities. I offer the realization that humanity is actually a birthday spectrum, a solar spectrum, that birthday is indeed a fundamental dimension of humanity. And I make the argument in joefriendly.org using my degree in electrical engineering from Caltech, I make the case pretty strong that what we're talking about is dimensionality with respect to the single most important item in all of life, without any question, the sun. The sun, those nuclear explosions going off every second, millions of them, hello America, that's the major player and birthday is our connection with that much power. And by attention to birthday, we can begin to learn how to talk together in groups that we identify the different hangups we have, the different prejudices we have, the different tricks we use to cheat. We learn humanity through and through so that we can have facilitators who decide when they got a bunch of people raising their hand, me, 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 who to call on next. <laughs> we can make some progress so that we can have group discussions that come up with decisions almost as good as those individuals I was telling you about. So, visit on YouTube, Peaceful Revolution Begins to participate in discussion with comment threads. And then I have Peaceful Revolution Begins where I have me and a beard talking about the revolution. I'll give you a hit of it here, let's see. Alternative reality in which the uh government in waiting puts into place the propositions that have been discussed locally, internationally, and just plain old nationally. 
on the internet. We talk through what goods should we make, where do we want to make them? What factories are there are appropriate without worrying about current ownership? The idea is... So I do have up on the internet, peaceful revolution begins, question mark. And then I put up there, what's the date of that baby? December 24, 2015. <laughs> that was my uh, first attempt at that. Uh, there's only been 196 views, but at least I got 10 thumbs up. That <laughs> counts. Um, and frankly, I do worry that comment threads is not quite enough as a way to discuss into being a government in waiting. And my camera lady did say, hey, Joe, how are you going to make it happen? What we're talking about is discussion. And I was picking out some women there before. I picked out Amy and Medea Benjamin and Naomi Klein to arrange the sequence. Who talks when? If we call on people to talk, they can build on what each one says. I propose we do this, and the other person takes it the next step. They don't have to fight with each other. They can build together. And what we're talking about is fairly straightforward. It is the idea of approaching with a blank slate the opportunity to do what's needed rather than to be stuck with the government as it is. That's what Santa Claus Joe Friendly is proposing, the alternative to Trump, is that we give ourselves that right, that power, to replace the whole game with a new game in the tradition of the Declaration of Independence, that we have a government that has fooled us, conned us, that is a nasty creature unto the world, that is a monster unto the world. How dare those Russians interfere in our election? Get over it, guys. We have interfered in plenty of elections. <laughs> Ooh. And we have done a lot of regime change, which gives the logic of a regime change we do need here, that we don't have to play along with a bogus election. The people if they have an alternative, can choose new voices to be their voices. That's the idea. Government is just voices proposing, how about this? And people with their cell phones or whatever we have, their computers, saying, yeah, that's democracy. Um, now, on this peaceful revolution begins, I offered some comments myself. And it says, first, comment thread discussion invited industry by industry, institution by institution, what changes you think are needed and how things ought to be. For example, pharmaceutical corporations, mainstream media, advertising, fashion, banking, farming, food, real estate, prisons, retailing, small business, unions, utilities, publishing, education. Is that a pretty good group of things that we should discuss? That's the idea, a, a revolution that total. Let's embrace it all. Let's figure out how things ought to be, being open with each other about the faults that are going on. Let's face it as a people. And I'm proposing smoking marijuana in that idea, in that tradition, that using the marijuana's help to the imagination to get high with the idea of using that additional mental power to face what's wrong and to imagine what we can replace it with. I'm proposing a dedication of the marijuana effect to the revolution. And some will dismiss our revolution as a pipe dream. Lots of luck, fellas, but that's the story, that marijuana is indeed what Jefferson smoked, what George Washington smoked. James Madison said if it wasn't for marijuana, he wouldn't have gotten that excited about democracy. Jefferson said smoking marijuana was among his fondest memories, enabling him to see as far as the eye could see. He gave marijuana pipes as presents to George Washington. Let's face it, America Marijuana has been demonized by the bad guys. That what marijuana does is enable people who've been bossed around to imagine their full dignity for a change. <laughs> that's the beauty of it. So that's a plug for marijuana. It should be legal 
it should be, it is declared legal in New York legislation here and there in the 70s and I would offer this constitutional argument we have the constitutional right of freedom of thought and for the government to take it away they have to have a good reason they're depriving us of marijuana is not based on any good reasons it's just political oppression and therefore our courts should strike it down that there's no state interest that would compel a court to allow their ruling that marijuana is bad and the simple fact that it is already legal <laughs> in other states means it's arbitrary and therefore it is an invasion not only on our freedom of thought but liberty itself which is freedom to do what you want to do as long as it doesn't harm somebody and if it's just you and the marijuana they're not claiming you're harming yourself anymore there's no harm so the law is unconstitutional that for the holiday gift to Santa Claus saying marijuana should be celebrated and even when it comes to driving cars they've done studies and found that marijuana is not the problem that alcohol is in driving cars that it does not cause the lessening of our reaction times that in some cases it even improves driving but that marijuana is not typically a problem with piloting a vehicle I don't know about airliners but uh, at least <laughs> your Chevy <laughs> uh, let's see here I say let's oh and then uh, that was the first comment how'd you like that list of the government in waiting was that pretty thorough yes in particular prisons let's face as a people the prison idea is obsolete it is a disgrace that the U.S. has more people in prison than anybody else. Let them out. That why torture these people? Prison is torture. It is a cruel form of slavery. And what is the logic of prisons? Our legal system? <laughs> Our legal system says, you have broken the law. Therefore, you must suffer so many years. Our terms are longer than the other countries and you know what is part of the problem commercialism has invaded the prison industry so they make more money I think they get something like a hundred thousand dollars a year for the prisoners I'm saying give them a thousand dollars a week that's only fifty thousand a year <laughs> and they bribe judges for longer sentences they pay for their campaigns there you can imagine that judges have political campaigns that they get money for and therefore the prison industry can fund campaigns that's a way for lawyers and prison people to bribe judges it's corruption it's ugh. so let's face that and not do it anymore hello that's the revolution not only are you supposed to cancel all debt every 50 years you're supposed to free the prisoners if we let them out of prison will they find work the whole purpose of this revolution is we are going to make work for everybody we are as a people going to design redesign our whole economic cultural system what services do we provide what goods to make and we figure out how to make them I was visiting a communist plant in Yugoslavia I was on a tour and we visited different factories and there was a factory in a town that made the rotator part of the distributor for the national truck the government produced a truck and they had this one community in charge of the rotor that goes inside the distributor for those of you who don't know your car mechanics that's the thing that spins around and sends sparks to the different spark plugs to fire in the right order and the rotation is connected up with the rotation of the motor sparks jump and stuff like that so there was a community of about 5,000 that had a factory that was modestly sized smaller than a schoolhouse but it had all the machinery they needed to make this part and what I was impressed about was the spirit within the company that they took turns at the different jobs so nobody would get bored and to me that was like wow <laughs> and they shared it as a community project and they were proud of making their contribution to the truck that they were aware of their responsibility and they made that rotor as good as they could that's the different spirit I'm 
proposing that instead of the games we have now with jobs where kids are uh, living with their parents because they uh, can't find work, that we make work for everybody. There's, there's not going to be a shortage of work. That's the design. Now, do you have any trouble imagining that? That if we, we just, what are we going to make and let's make it. If, if the public owns the economy, we can dig where we need to dig, we can move what we need to move, we can buy machinery, we have all these vacant factories. But now we're getting into robotics and people are being replaced. Everything can be outsourced except entrepreneurship and innovation. The idea, my dear, is that once the public is in charge, instead of the commercial corporations, that all the new ideas can be used for the good instead of being used to make things worse. And what's happening now is everything is a, a means of the bad guys doing worse stuff. So I'm saying a new way of doing things. The next step is for Medea Benjamin and Amy Goodman and Naomi Klein and Tom Hartman and Phil Donahue and Ralph Nader to say, yeah, it makes sense, Joe. We do need to start that discussion. We do need to create the other. And one more person or two I should remember, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> he just wrote a book on the revolution. I haven't read it. Hello. Bernie, sorry about that. <laughs> Jill Stein. In fact, Democracy Now!, not only Amy, but her whole team is indeed part of the revolution. That they, she put together a team who can pick the right kind of people for the right kind of discussions. We have, the idea is revolution by discussion. <laughs> We create a government in waiting by discussion. And we have the social media means to do that usefully. We need leadership, and I'm proposing that we do point a finger at this handful of people I've picked out online. If you look at my joefriendly.com, that's my plan for peaceful revolution. I have it here. It's uh, lots of words. <laughs> um, in fact, this is a, even a longer version. But you got the gist of it. The idea is to approach with a blank slate the way things ought to be, giving ourselves the ownership and having faith in humanity to the extent that we could count on people ultimately caring about each other. Hello. Oh, as far as the birthday thing, you'll see that on, online. I was saying the Copernicus thing and all that, the power of the sun, dimensional. That's pretty much it, except I have worked on birthday for 50 years. I got some useful things to say about it. And uh, more of that next time. Or look at it online. Joe Friendly's plan for peaceful but total revolution. Joe Friendly's explanation for the significance of birthday. Truth for a Change, his daily Monday through Friday Manhattan cable TV show at 10 in the morning. Lahayan. <laughs>